Now, we also now have the opportunity, because we have this sequence of the genome, to really begin to focus on that 0.1% of difference. And this is a huge opportunity for understanding what the hereditary factors are for common diseases. Because some of those differences are maybe ones you wish you didn't have that are placing uh, you at risk for something. And even here in the ASA, I have to tell you a bad bit of news, and that is there are no perfect specimens. We all have flaws. This is the, uh, you know, genetic equivalent of original sin. We are all fallen creatures at the DNA level. And we're all walking around with dozens uh, of these glitches which place us at risk for something. Most of them you won't find out about because you don't have the environmental trigger that sets them off or the collection of glitches that is sufficient to get you over a threshold. But we are in the next short period of time going to discover uh, many of these uh, for common diseases. And that's going to be very exciting because of its possibility of providing information about uh, disease. This is the group that's been working on that uh, very intensely, trying to understand that 0.1 percent. This is another big organized project like the Genome Project involving six countries, thousands of scientists. This one only took three years. It's actually done now, called the HapMap uh, Project. Again, I had the privilege of being the project manager for this enterprise and watching this take shape over a remarkably short period of time. And we now have an incredibly detailed catalog of the variation in the human genome that we never thought we would get uh, until much, uh, much beyond this time. And it's also now sitting on the Internet to be able to use so that people will, in the next a little while, find the uh, major genetic factors for all of the diseases you see listed here and many others, anything that has a hereditary contribution. We finally now have the tools to go and find that. So you're going to see an absolute outpouring of these kinds of discoveries uh, over the course of the next two or three years because finally we have the powerful tools to do this. And that's going to be very exciting because when you have the opportunity uh, to find the genetic con contributions uh, to a disease, that then gets you in a position to be able to apply this clinically. And some of those applications will be to identify who's at high risk by using uh, this information diagnostically and then offering them prevention. We're already starting to do that, for instance, in some families that have a high incidence of cancer, we can figure out who else is at high risk even before they've developed any symptoms and make sure those people are getting very frequent screening uh, to be able to pick up cancer while it's still easily treated. There are many other opportunities uh, where diagnostics and prevention of that sort are going to become a reality over the course of the next few years. We're also learning that these variations in DNA are a powerful way of predicting drug response. That's the field of pharmacogenomics. Do not be surprised if in the next four or five years, uh, when you are in need of a drug for some a condition, that the physician wants to check your DNA first before writing the prescription to be sure that that's the right drug for you and the right dose. Because the variation in response uh, to drugs, which is well known, much of that is based on differences in genetics and can be predicted as we generate more and more of this data. But perhaps most excitingly, all of these dis discoveries about genetic contributions to disease finally put us in a position of being able to have really detailed information about why disease comes about in the first place. And so instead of designing empirical treatments, we have the chance to design those that really go right to the heart of the matter. And some of those will be gene therapies, but I think many of them will be drug therapies that are based on that kind of precise understanding and are therefore more effective and less toxic than many of the drugs we currently use. And you can already see the leading edge of this kind of gene-based drug design happening, particularly in cancer, uh, with drugs like uh, Gleevec and Iressa and Tarceva and Herceptin, all of which have come along fairly recently and which are specifically targeted towards a knowledge of the genetic glitch in a particular condition. In those cases, uh, it is lung cancer or leukemia. So this is good news. I notice I didn't label the axis over there because I don't know, and it'll be different for each disease. And some diseases will move from top to bottom here in the course of a few years, and others will take longer than that. But I do think it's fair to say that by perhaps 2020 anyway, uh, medicine will be quite dramatically changed as a result of this. And even by 2015, for many diseases, you'll see substantial differences. And perhaps as soon as 2010, the opportunity for doing some of the diagnostics and prevention will become a reality. Uh, and that's certainly something very much uh, to look forward to. Another thing that we've learned a lot about is looking at our own genome, which parts of it seem to be most important for function. And this is now going to get us into a comparison of genomes, which of course will then lead us into a discussion about evolution. 
If we look at our own DNA, those three billion letters, and we line that up with the DNA of other species, you can begin to ask, okay, what seems to be most similar? It's not surprising that the parts of the genome that code for protein tend to be the most similar ones uh, when you look at other organisms, but they don't count for all of it. In fact, they only count for about a third of the most functionally important part that is mostly most conserved sequences in the genome. The other two-thirds falls in places we didn't really know were important before. And this is an incredibly important tool now for zeroing in on the parts of the genome that we most need to understand that are probably most vulnerable if they have mistakes in them in terms of causing disease. So a incredibly powerful and forward-looking part of genome research right now is based on this kind of comparison between species. And although it took us uh, 13 years to sequence the human genome, we can now sequence a mammalian genome in about six months, and that's getting shorter all the time because the technology has roared ahead so quickly. And that is uh, providing us with incredible opportunities to do these kinds of comparisons. So we have the mouse genome sequence, which was derived not long after the human. Uh, the dog genome, this is kind of a cute cover if you look closely here. Dogs admiring this, and if you even look at the picture of Watson and Crick, there seems to be another a character that's been interposed uh, that's uh, Tasha, the boxer, who was the blood donor for the sequence that was used to get the dog genome sequence. So Tasha is admiring uh, the results here. <laughs> so we have that, and perhaps of greatest controversy to many people, we have the sequence of the chimpanzee, our closest relative. And yes, when you do line up the DNA sequence of humans in the areas where they line up, which is almost all of it, the identity is 98.8% between us and our closest relative. So we're all 99.9% .9 the same, but the chimp is only 98.8% uh, the same. So enough differences there apparently to cause a rather different appearance and a very different organism, and one which we as uh, believers would say uh, is profoundly different. But at the DNA level, it's pretty subtle. And you might ask, if you've been uh, looking at the uh, paper lately, what about this? We are engaged now in sequencing the genome of the Neanderthal. There are enough specimens of bone available uh, from various burial grounds in Eastern Europe uh, to be able, with very careful technologies, to extract DNA from these 30 to 40,000 year old specimens. It's hugely complicated because any contamination from any other source and suddenly you're sequencing human DNA and not Neanderthal. And even when you do get the Neanderthal DNA, it's been chemically degraded, so there's certain bases you can't trust and you have to sort of um, guess what those might have been. But it does look to me as if in the course of the next two or three years, we'll have a pretty good representation of what that genome looked like. And so far, it's about what you would have guessed uh, based on what uh, people had predicted in terms of how long ago it was that Neanderthals branched off of the same uh, tree that ultimately gave rise to Homo sapiens. Uh, it does not appear at the present time, although this is early days, uh, that there actually was interbreeding between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens in Europe, although it's pretty clear that they were both there at about the same time. So we now have DNA sequence uh, on all of these organisms that you see appearing here, and, and many more are in the pipeline. So over the course of just a few years since the sequence of the human genome, uh, we have information on more than 30 genomes at a very reasonable cost. This is actually a very tiny fraction of what uh, is being spent on biomedical research. But this is incredibly valuable information for trying to understand our own genome. That's really the point. I mean, those organisms are all kind of weird and wonderful, but the point for me is to use that information so that we can try to see what can we learn about our own sequence. 